about 20 minutes, so I usually take a lot longer to do this, so I'm going to kind of try to speed through and cover as much as we can. Um, so to start off, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I am a lawyer who was trained at a big law firm, one of these ones with over a thousand attorneys, and I worked for Fortune 100 companies and worked on the Madoff Ponzi scheme recovery. I now have my own practice, and I work with small and mid-sized businesses and help them as outside general counsel with everything from negotiating and drafting their contracts to going to court when disputes arise and settling or going to trial as necessary. So the first thing we're going to cover in terms of any business is business entities. So there's several types of business entities that you consider when you're starting a business. There are sole proprietorships, partnerships, S-corporations, C-corporations, and limited liability. There are factors that go into this consideration of what type of business entity you should choose. So one issue that's very important is liability issues. Are you okay with personal liability or do you want to limit your liability? Another issue is tax implication. So that's why it's important to talk to a business CPA when you're considering how, what form of business entity you want to structure as well as where to structure. Then you have issues regarding complexity of formation and management. So, for example, sole proprietorship is a lot easier to set up and manage than a C corporation. Then you have to think about capital. Certain types of businesses have different abilities to raise capital. So, for example, a sole proprietorship, you're only going to be able to raise capital through a loan to yourself. C corporation, you have opportunities to allow get investment through venture capital because you have stock. So those are some of the considerations. Um, so, you know, sole proprietorship, as we discussed, is an individual that's carrying on business for profit. Uh, if you're going to conduct the business under a different name than your own name, you need to get a fictional uh, you know, name publication with the county you're operating in. You have to consider that any assets that you're going to transfer in the sale, it's going to be not the business itself, but just those assets. A general partnership is similar to a sole proprietorship in, in, in that there isn't a lot that goes into necessarily like setting that up. Uh, there is no limitation on liability, but you're going to have to put in a partnership agreement in place to protect yourself. So I you know, deal with people who often will try to cut costs on the front end and they will make a handshake deal. And you know, I've seen that then go to litigation. And that's where litigation gets really costly because you're dealing with an issue of uh, agreement where it's a he said, she said, and you don't actually have any of the terms specified. So now you're in court and you're having to spend a lot of money and time litigating every single issue where if you had the agreement in place on the front end, a lot of these issues would have already been addressed in that agreement. So it would have made the dispute a lot easier to resolve. Additionally, I've dealt with a situation where you do have this oral agreement. Uh, former business partners can come, will come back and sue you if you're doing well and assert an interest in what you're doing. So I've had clients like that who just had the oral agreement and 10 years later they've had someone come and say, well, now that you're successful, that's half mine. So, best protect yourself. Uh, S corporation is a type of corporation. It's a little bit different than a C corporation as it has limits on shareholders. C corporation is the typical type of corporation you see a lot of uh, companies that are seeking venture capital use a C corporation. All the public traded companies are C corporations. They allow for different classes of stock and have no limits of types of shareholders. Limited liability companies are another type of common business entity that a lot of people use because it does limit your liability and it does allow for different people to have interest in a business, but instead of shareholders, they're called members. So again, with a limited liability company, uh, as with the corporation, it's important to have the proper agreement in place. So the agreements for a corporation are bylaws and shareholder agreements. 
So bylaws set out the procedures for the shareholders, terms of directors, and the duties as well as indemnification, uh, meaning that if something goes wrong, who's liable for that? Shareholder agreements kind of set out restrictions on ownership, transfer of stock, how, what happens when the corporation is sold, who owns the intellectual property. So all of those issues are addressed on the front end to kind of cut down some of these dispute areas on the back end. Those issues are addressed in operating agreements for limited liability companies. So the, limit, the operating agreement takes the place of a bylaws and the shareholder agreement. And they, these operating agreements address issues about membership interest, what happens when a member wants to leave, what happens when the LLC is sold, etc. One issue with any business that's very important is if you're going for limited liability, so you're picking one of these business entities, such as the corporation, the liability company, you want to make sure you're actually preserving that limitation of liability. So you need to be preserving that business as a separate entity as yourself. So you have to make sure it's appropriately capitalized from the very beginning. There's separate records for all the businesses. You have you know, a corporate book with all the agreements in place. You are not commingling funds with different businesses or with yourself. Because if you're not adhering to those corporate formalities and making sure the businesses set up appropriately, capitalized, and has that separate nature from yourself or your business, someone can come in and argue that it, it's on, the business is an alter ego of you and they can come and hold you personal liable, personally liable. So you need to adhere to those corporate formalities to actually have that limited liability. Another area that is relevant to any business is employment law. And this covers a whole host of issues. So it's everything from non-disclosure of information and trade secrets, non-competition issues, which is not allowed in California against employees, non-solicitation of employees and customers, assignment of intellectual property, employee duties, compensation, and terms of the agreement between the parties. So when you are working with people in terms of your business, you have two options. You have employees or independent contractors. So employees can be terminated at will. They, you have to pay taxes for them. You have to provide them benefits. You assume liability for what they do. For independent contractors, they're subject to whatever the terms of your contract with them is. You don't have to pay taxes for them. You don't have to provide them benefits but you don't have control over their work product, and you may or may not have liability for their actions based on the terms of your agreement. Um, you also, uh, one other issue with that kind of space is that there is new case law that says that, you know, if someone is working, if you're hiring someone to do the work that is your core area of business, they are properly classified as an employee versus independent contractor. So think of that if you're a web development business and you are hiring someone to do web development, then that person is employed. If you're getting someone to do some janitorial work here and there, that could be an independent contractor. So this is new kind of case law that's cutting down on the ability to classify people as independent contractors. Additional issues that you should be considering when you are hiring employees is discrimination issues. So you can't discriminate against anyone uh, on a whole variety of bases, bases and it involves throughout the whole process from hiring, promotion, discharge, and all other aspects of employment. Then there are a whole host of other employment rules that you have to adhere to as an employer. So there are leave, act, you know, leave act issues, there's HIPAA, there's unemployment compensation, workers' compensation, jury duty leave. Uh, additionally, you have to be careful if someone calls you and asks for uh, reference for a prior employee, you have to be careful what you say so that you don't get sued for defamation. Employment in California is at will, so that means that in the absence of a contract between you and the employee, they can leave whenever they want and you can get rid of them whenever you want. If you are you know, getting rid of an employee without cause, that does mean they can file for unemployment compensation and raise your rates there. 
one important thing to kind of address a lot of employment issues in a business is it's important to have a proper employee handbook in place. The advantage is that an employee handbook is a communication tool that sets out the terms of the relationship between you and the employee. It helps avoid misunderstandings and can help in unemployment or discrimination claims. However, if it's badly drafted, it might actually hurt you. So you need to make sure you have a proper employment handbook that to address intellectual property. So this is a very important business asset for a lot of businesses. So think about tech businesses, media entertainment businesses. Intellectual property is the most valuable asset for these businesses. So it's important to be taking efforts to preserve intellectual property because it gives you both freedom to operate as you're, no one, you're basically being able to use that intellectual property that you own in different ways in the market and giving you a competitive advantage because other parties are not now allowed to use that intellectual property because you've asserted ownership over it. So there are several ways to protect intellectual property. There are copyrights, which includes works of authorship, and that includes software. There's trademarks, so think of that as any symbol or device that identifies a source of goods or services, so think of it as a company logo. Patents are also relevant to a lot of businesses, and then you have trade secrets, which are broader than the other forms of intellectual property and can include things such as customer lists. So I like to always use the example of Hershey Kitchens because it includes all types of intellectual property protection. So for example, the Hershey Kid has a trademark for its shape, it has a patent for its method of reducing fat levels in cocoa, it's a copyright for the commercials and advertisements that are used, and there's a trade secret on its recipe for producing the milk chocolate. So that company has protected this piece of intellectual property in so many different ways. So we, you know, copyrights give you the exclusive right of, work, of ownership, you can reproduce it, you can create derivative works, etc. Um, and anything that's important with kind of getting this protection is when you're, the best protection is when you register it with the government because it allows you to have things such as statutory damages, so guaranteed damages if someone infringes, to be able to go to court and get injunctive relief, really, meaning you can ask the court to, uh, you know, prevent someone from using that property. It also allows you the opportunity to, uh, you know, basically have a stronger ability to be able to license your intellectual property and kind of monetize it that way. Uh, similar with trademarks, you know, it's best to kind of register these and you could, you know, it applies both to goods as well as services as I mentioned. We talked about patents. So trade secrets, as I said, stated, is broader than the intellectual property. And an example of this is, for example, recipes and formulas such as KC Chicken and Coke, and client lists, and even algorithms. Um, so one thing that's important to actually preserving something as a trade secret is that it can't be something that is publicly known. So you have to take steps to actually preserve its secret you know, nature. So that means only disclosing it to people who need to know and having the appropriate agreements in place to preserve the confidentiality of that uh, information. Trade secrets are interesting in the term that they can be reverse engineered because it's not something that's registered with the government and so it's not uh, you know, protected in that sense of being able to no one else to use it. No one else can use it if they steal it from you, so if they misappropriate it from you. But if someone else is able to create the same thing separately, they can use it. So think of this as, for example, Listerine um, was a trade secret, but now it's been reverse engineered and all these competing mouth wash companies have been able to create the four, same formula independently. Another area that's very important to businesses is contractual agreements. So it's appropriate, it's important to have the appropriate contracts in place for the start. And these type of contracts cover all sorts of issues when you are setting up and operating a business. You know, these, there are the independent contractor consultant agreements we talked about. There's employee agreements, 
client agreements, sales contracts, service agreements, leases for building equipment, vehicles, there are vendor agreements, banking agreements, zoning agreements, licensing agreements, partnership agreements. So these are all things that you need to be considering as you're setting up and operating. Then there are liability issues. So what are some of the typical forms of liability that any business faces? So one type of liability a business faces is premises liability. So think of this as someone comes on your property and gets hurt, they can then sue you. Two, there's the contract liability. So if any of your contracts are breached by the other party or you breach them, they can come after you for your breach and you can go after someone for their breach. There's also negligence issues. So for example, if you are selling a product and something goes wrong with it, someone's injured, they can come after you for negligence. You also have to be careful in the type of advertisements you use because you may be liable for false advertising if you say things that are not true or if you incorporate people who may have not actually you know, endorsed your product, then you can be liable for defamation or libel. Um, additionally, depending on what statements, you have to be careful what statements you make whenever you are kind of entering into that contra contract negotiation because you don't want to be later hold ac held accountable for making fraudulent statements. So what are some of the top takeaways for any small or mid-sided business? One, go for limited liability. Two, have an employee handbook and make sure you're actually following it. Three, understand timekeeping and pay laws. Protect your intellectual property and trade secrets. Safeguard your name and logo. Have well-drafted agreements in place. And make sure you have a budget for advisors. Everything from operations, accounting, to legal. Uh, so now I will take some questions. And just to make sure everyone understands, this is purely educational. None of this is legal advice. Yes, Don't have that kind of limitation, and they have more classes of stocks that are preferred 
by businesses that are trying to actually get investment and venture capital? Um, if you make a statement on your website and it's halfway through, halfway off, is it considered false advertisement? Wow. Um, I mean, that doesn't sound like a good start when you're like, hey, not, this is not true. <laughs> so, that doesn't, that doesn't sound like a good situation. So, what about the non-profit organizations? Like, which one, uh, which one of those business entities uh, covers that? Uh, okay, the question was, what kind of entities do nonprofit businesses have? Yeah. Uh, nonprofit businesses have their own separate types of entities. So there are nonprofit corporations, and there's uh, such thing as a B Corp. That's a, uh, a form that some charity organizations use. So that's specific to those that is separate from the typical business structures. Is that one question? One last question. Last question. About um, intellectual property. If we're working with um, developers, software developers that are overseas, um, what's the best way to make sure that you know we have like all the rights to that software and uh, yeah, well, it's yeah. Uh, it's appropriate to have the strong contracts in place. So, you know, I deal with clients who have cross-border transactions all the time. So we just have to make sure you have a very, you know, the, you work with your attorney to make sure you have a very uh, strong contract in place so that you're able to pursue if things go wrong. Thank you so much for all the questions and the answers. It's uh, amazing. I had the privilege to be the host uh, in an interview I had in Mumbai. And she was so sweetheart and kind, and, and it was amazing how such a person can be so strong and powerful in the job. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you for having me.